So, you want to save the world with clean energy? Make money doing it? Confused about the economic and technical realities of residential and commercial solar, batteries, heat pumps, EVs? Want the real world scoop on new energy technologies, not manufacture hype? Then tune in to the Weekly Energy Show, hosted by Barry Cinnamon. Insights from Barry's 40 plus years in the solar and energy industry will help you understand the future ways we'll generate and consume energy. And now, here's Barry. Welcome to this week's Energy Show. We're going to talk about community solar this week. It's an interesting concept. Now, the reason why community solar came about is about 15% of the homeowners in the United States aren't good candidates for their own rooftop solar system. These are people who have a shaded roof or a small roof, or they live in an apartment. Obviously, they may not have access to any roof at all. Or they may have a really small electric bill, and it doesn't make sense to put a tiny little solar system on because the, the economics aren't right. Solar's not cost-effective for a tiny system. So the solution is some kind of shared solar power system. Big system, and everybody can chip in to own it, and everybody would get some of the benefits. So that's where the concept of community solar, or sometimes it's referred to as a solar garden, came about. Now, there's different flavors of these community solar systems. Generally, an investor, and this could be a private investor, this could be a utility, or this could be a nonprofit, would decide to build a big solar installation, certainly bigger than what we you need for a single house. Various sizes, depending on locations. Some of the smallest ones are 50 kilowatts, and the biggest ones are, are 5 to 10 megawatts or more. Generally, they're located on public land or jointly owned property. Because sometimes there's not a lot to do with this property. Sometimes it might be uh, a parking structure on top of a parking lot, things like that. So this investor group, private utility or nonprofit, would deal with the design work, the permitting, the utility interconnection, the paperwork to get it started, managing the organization and the, and the billing. And the investor that would be getting this started would also get the incentives like the investment tax credit, renewable energy credits, and any other applicable local benefits. Sometimes there's local and state incentives. And then individuals would sign up to get a certain share of their electricity from the solar installation. And in many cases, this can be a really big financial uh, value. So just imagine you had a little bit of a neighborhood and there was a local park and there was a parking lot around this park, and you put solar on top of this parking lot. Now, the park doesn't need electricity, but maybe the 20 or 30 houses around that park could use the electricity. That's kind of the idea behind community solar, and the idea is, is actually starting to grow. So the status so far, there's about 25 states with at least one community solar project online. There's 91 projects and over 100 megawatts installed through early 2016. So this concept's gradually taking off. About a dozen states, plus the District of Columbia, have recognized the benefits of shared renewables. It's community solar systems. And they're encouraging their growth through good policies that encourage this and programs. Some of the states that are biggest in community solar are California, Colorado, Massachusetts, and Minnesota. They're going to install the majority of these projects. And many, many other states have good programs. And unfortunately, some states are basically opposed to these programs. And these are there are state regulations or laws that prevent these systems from going into place. We'll talk about a little bit more of that next. Over the next five years, the, there's expectations that the U.S. community solar market is going to grow to a couple of gigawatts or more compared to just 66 megawatts through the end of 2014. And the development challenge really is mostly on the policy and the regulatory side. Um, it, it's just something that takes a while to get going. You need the right rules in place. So there's three basic types of community solar systems. I mentioned that before. The most common are utility-owned. And this is a case where the utility installs a community solar system. You know, maybe I talked about that example of a, of a big park, and they may just say, hey, we're going to put a, a megawatt system in this area, or maybe they're going to put it on a landfill that nobody uses, and the power from that landfill is going to go to the local community. So the energy from that, uh, that community solar system is then sold, just like regular electricity, to people who sign up for power from this community solar. Now, usually when the utilities sell it, the electricity sold at a markup. The utilities make money on it, and often the green electricity from these systems is actually more expensive than regular electricity. So the utility might be selling 
electricity at 15 cents a kilowatt hour. And they may say that if you want to sign up for a clean, green energy program where your power is coming from solar and wind, it's going to be 17 cents. And there's a lot of people who just are that committed to the environment that they're willing to pay extra. And, and you know, generally, that's a really good thing because the customers do benefit from saying they've got clean energy and some people want to do that. Second model is a private ownership of the system or a special purpose entity. That's accounting speak, SPE. It's accounting speak for a separate company that's set up just to do a certain thing. So this is a private company that was created to develop and maintain, manage the project. Now, we're not, not talking about a, a building where these you know, there's a lot of accountants and lawyers and installers working. Now, this is something that the accountants and lawyers set up, and it's basically just an entity, and they basically subcontract out all the, the heavy lifting, all the work. Now, the way that works is the owners of the company may get a share of the energy from the system, or they may just profit from it. So, for example, you might have 100 people that might invest in this special purpose entity, and they each own 1% of the benefits of the system, and they also may get their benefits back in terms of free or or heavily discounted electricity. And the third type of community solar is really some some kind of community solar that's developed completely by a nonprofit, maybe a a church group or, or just people in the community want to donate for this community solar system, and it's completely owned and operated by this nonprofit. That's probably the cheapest way to get energy from community solar because there's there's no entity out there that wants to make an extra profit on it. So the costs are donated and the benefits are shared by the nonprofit entity and everybody participates. So the challenge is it's kind of hard to raise money for a nonprofit. There's lots of other entities out there that are really worthy of that funding, but nonprofit community solar could, could work out. Now, one of the things that's making community solar work is called virtual net metering. Now, just to back up, net metering is a concept where customers can actually run their electric meters backwards during the day when they're generating excess power. And essentially, they're only getting billed for the net amount of energy they use over the year. So you run your meter backwards during the day, you run it forwards in the afternoon and at night, and at the end of the year, you only pay for the net amount you used. And it works out great because you can size a solar system to generate less than 100% of the power you need so that you pay a little bit. Let's say you're generating 80% of the power you need, so your bill is reduced by 80%, and you pay that 20% to the utility, and that's how net metering works. Now, virtual net metering extends this concept to a group of people who share the output of the system. So, for example, if the system generates 500 kilowatt hours a day, and there's 100 people who share the system equally, then each of the members of this community solar organization would get a daily credit on their bill of 5 kilowatt hours. And they, that's going to reduce their, their energy costs, and um, that's also going to be their benefit for investing in the system. Now, with this model, virtual net metering amounts would go towards any applicable net metering cap. And that's kind of problematic. So if, if big community solar systems are put in place, it would kind of, in a certain degree, crowd out some standard net metering installations that homeowners or businesses would put in. But that, these are big issues that are being discussed really all around the country when it comes to net metering. Now, the benefits of community solar really depend on the type of installation that's being done. I think it's a a great idea in general because community solar is going to allow that 50% of the people in the country and 50% of the businesses that can't get solar, it's going to allow them to benefit from solar. We're going to get more clean, renewable solar power installed. We're going to also create more good local jobs. The downside, and this is something that we have to watch out for, as I mentioned, the downside is it, it could crowd out other types of solar installations. So if a lot of community solar goes in, let's say it's community solar that's sponsored by utilities, then these net metering caps are going to be reached sooner, and it may limit the amount of solar that can be installed on rooftops owned by homeowners or owned by businesses. Now, why is that bad? Well, because generally, the electricity that's sold by utility is more expensive than the electricity that a homeowner or a business could generate on their own. So utility community solar is going to end up with electricity to the customer, to the owner of the building, more expensive than if they were to put in their own system. But these are things that we can work out, and and I'm really looking forward to improvements there. So let's talk a bit about the different types of business models that are used for community solar. Utility model, special purpose entities, and nonprofits. So I mentioned initially 
In the utility model, the systems are financed and owned by the utilities, and they get grants, and they may have their own cash flow and, and capital to invest this, or they get contributions from ratepayers, or, or they rate base rate base this. They'll take out a loan, and they'll um, have ratepayers pay it back over years. Special purpose entities generally financed by member investments, and also offset by incentives out there, and nonprofit community solar installations are financed by donor contributions and grants. So I mentioned how these things are hosted. Hosted is like who installs it, who runs it. Utilities own it, and they're basically starting it, managing it, running it. With special purpose entities, they'll usually subcontract out the ownership and the management of the system, and the nonprofit will also subcontract that out. Now, as far as who uses, who, who gets the benefits of the electricity, from these different systems. We'll talk about that in terms of a subscriber who gets the power. With utilities, it's all of the ratepayers that, that get it, and they can kind of sign up for this, or sometimes the utility is just going to take all that power themselves. With a special purpose entity, it's usually the power is distributed to community investors. I mentioned you've got a big park. They may put a system there, and the people in that community can then sign up and access it. For nonprofit community solar Usually it's the people who subscribe to it or the people who donate money into this nonprofit. Now, why do these different models come about? What's the motive there? Well, for utilities, they want to basically find a way to generate electricity and, and really help meet their, their RPS standards or their green goals. They, they want to be the green power generators. Special purpose entities, they're, they're a profit-making entity, so they want to make, their, they want to make somewhat of a profit. And for nonprofits, it's not as much a return on investment, but it's more for philanthropic reasons. Now, in terms of the long-term strategies that these sponsors have, the, uh, the utilities are really kind of looking out. They're looking over, over a long time horizon, and they want to make sure that they've got that green power, and they want to be leaders in green power. For special purpose entities, they want to basically make some money. And I'd say a lot of these special purpose entities have a business model whereby they're not going to just do one. They're going to kind of cookie cutter these and bang them out. And for nonprofits, they want to retain that electricity for the life of the system and, and just kind of meet their philanthropic goals. So some examples of a utility community solar model, Sacramento Municipal Utility District has their solar shares program, SMUD has always been a pioneer with this. Tucson Electric Power has their Bright Tucson program. There's a lot of companies that are doing these special purpose entities that they keep cropping up kind of all over the country. They're mostly set up as limited liability corporations. And there's a few of these nonprofits out there. It's still the nonprofit systems are kind of on the small side. And we talk about the sizes. The nonprofit side, because it's hard to raise a lot of money, these systems are usually under 100 kilowatts frequently, and some of them are 50 or 20 kilowatts. And it's hard to find customers and people to sign up. It's hard to raise money for a nonprofit. For the special purpose entities, these systems are kind of fitting in in the medium size. Some of them might be hundreds or maybe up to a megawatt, hundreds of kilowatts, up to a megawatt inside. These are businesses, and they've got to basically raise the money and then sell the power to customers. They don't have the infrastructure to do that either, so they've got some higher costs. And when I'm talking about infrastructure, I'm talking about people and lawyers and paperwork and things like that that's kind of built in. The advantage that the utilities have is they have a built-in customer base that they can solicit. They, they know how to develop these projects, and they have this infrastructure in place so that they can build customers and manage the systems very well. So they kind of have a big advantage when it comes to um, community solar. So why aren't more community solar systems going in? Well, the biggest challenge is that it's very complicated in terms of local laws and regulations. There's very complicated financial and accounting requirements. I mean, just imagine what's involved in just starting up a company. Well, you're now starting up a company that's going to have to raise money from investors or an organization that's going to have to do that. And then you're going to have to somehow find a way to distribute the profits or the revenues or the benefits to the investors. Now, when it comes to community solar structures, one of the tricks is to make sure that the energy savings are not characterized as income. Otherwise, taxes would be due. So imagine if you had this special purpose entity, people invested, they took their after-tax money, put it into the special purpose entity, and the profits that they got back, they want those profits to come back in a way that's untaxed. So the way they can get that profit back is actually getting paid in electricity. And, and there's ways to structure it so they wouldn't get taxed on that. When utilities own the systems, it's usually a lot easier. Uh, they're, they're not obligated 
to offer the lower cost electricity. I mean, we would love it if they were, but basically that's not their absolute mandate. And, and what ends up happening when utilities own these systems is that they could crowd out other solar developments. The utilities could meet their RPS caps, they could meet the net metering caps by putting in a lot of solar, and that kind of frees up more installations for them and kind of crowds out thousands of contractors out there and, and possible special purpose entities that would want to do these community solar gardens. Now, sometimes utility ownership of community solar is the only option because some states and, and locations have local policies which basically prohibit the third-party sales of electricity. I'm thinking about you, Florida, the Sunshine State, where only a utility can sell electricity. That means that you can't have a community solar garden that would distribute that electricity. You can't even have a solar lease or something like that that would distribute that electricity. There's reasons why that just doesn't take off. And I'd love to see that situation change. Florida would be a great state for solar. Now, with private or special purpose entities, it's a difficult and risky thing for an investor group to put together this kind of a package. I mean, just imagine you're going you're to raise a few million dollars to put in a few of these solar gardens. There's, there's a lot of time involved in getting it set up, and there's regulatory uncertainty. That's why the first ones are really tough to do, to kind of figure out in a location what's the rubber stamp process. And what you also want to do for a private or special purpose entity community solar facility is you want to offer a better deal on electricity than your customers could ordinarily get, which you can do with community solar or rooftop solar. The thing is when you have that kind of special purpose entity, that entity also needs to make a profit. So you gotta spread the benefits around a little bit, but it's definitely doable. And with nonprofits, the big challenge, it's hard to always find donors and members to, to belong to that kind of nonprofit group. Now the reality is, that the bigger the community solar system, it's going to always have the most favorable economics. The installation costs are lower as system sizes increase. So I'm just kind of thinking about system costs. Utility solar is going in for a dollar and a half or less per watt, whereas your average residential system might be six kilowatts or so, probably averages around three and a half dollars a watt. So utilities can be half the cost or less than a conventional rooftop system. You have also significant operating cost savings. If you're selling power to a thousand people in a community solar garden, there's a thousand people that are going to share that infrastructure, the billing, the accounting, the legal costs. There's a thousand people that are going to also share that operating cost. These systems require a little bit of maintenance and that, that's kind of spread out. So the more participants, the more electricity sales you have, that means that these fixed costs are spread out over larger groups. And it's very expensive, as I mentioned, for a special purpose entity or nonprofit to do the very first system. After that, the cost can go down a lot. But the first time, you've got to figure out these tricky finance issues, accounting issues, find out what the regulations are for shared solar, negotiate with your utility and public utilities commission for permission to do this and share the overhead. But the thing is, when you kind of look at all these factors, the economics for community solar are almost always worse than for a customer-hosted system. That's why I recommend that if you have room for solar on your roof, you put it in yourself. If you can't put solar on, then look into community solar. So what's trending right now? Mostly utility ownership of community solar. It's a good way for utilities to go green. The utilities have the money and the advocacy horsepower for this kind of model. And Florida's a perfect example of that. One of the things that you should look at if you're interested is go to Vote Solar's Guiding Principles for Shared Renewables. And these are just really great principles for ensuring both that community solar grows and other forms of solar deployment, such as customer-owned solar grows. So their principles, they've got four of them. One, expand renewable energy access to a broader group of energy consumers. Find a way to make that 50% of the people in the country and the business in the country accessible to solar. The second, provide tangible economic benefits on customers' utility bills. Lower their cost of electricity. Don't raise it or don't keep it the same. Third, remain flexible enough to account for energy consumers' preferences. Some people might want a little electricity. Some people might want a lot. And finally, be additive to and supportive of existing renewable energy programs, not undermining them. And we don't want to see these community solar programs come into place, and it clobbers existing solar businesses. So I think the future is great. For community solar, it's, it's great for a way to get 50% of the homes and businesses in the United States getting power from clean, renewable solar. And vote solar's principles are great. Now, if you're a homeowner or a business without a sunny roof, and if you're in a state that has good solar policies, then consider community solar. But if you have a sunny roof in a friendly solar state, 
really look into putting rooftop solar in yourself. This is something that you're going to get better economics for if you can own, whether you're a business or a consumer. Well, that's all the time we have on this week's Energy Show. Thanks to all of our listeners for tuning in. And if you missed any of today's show, you can always go to our website at cinnamonsolar.com and listen to the podcasts. So, you want to save the world with clean energy? Make money doing it? Confused about the economic and technical realities of residential and commercial solar, batteries, heat pumps, EVs? Want the real-world scoop on new energy technologies, not manufacture hype? Then tune in to the Weekly Energy Show, hosted by Barry Cinnamon. Insights from Barry's 40-plus years in the solar and energy industry will help you understand the future ways we'll generate and consume energy. And now, here's Barry. Barry.